strike that rocked central Mexico on Tuesday. The official death toll rose to 223 today, and the nation's president warned every minute counts to save lives. A desperate search for life today in Mexico City. Police, firefighters, and volunteers digging into a collapsed school. Sometimes they found survivors, sometimes not, but the search went on. People are helping. We are gathering at the collection center and managing as we can. People are showing a lot of solidarity. The quake hit Tuesday afternoon near the Puebla state town of Raboso, 76 miles southeast of Mexico City. The violence of the shaking was evident. Buildings swayed and convulsed and at least 44 collapsed, lost in plumes of smoke. Pleasure boats were tossed like toys in a bathtub. Terrified people streamed from homes and offices. Horrible, horrible, horrible. frighteningly horrible. A wing of a school pancaked into concrete slabs. Rescuers dug frantically, some with bare hands. At times, raised arms signaled the crowd for silence as they listened for sounds of life. The search went on through the night under the glare of floodlights and the watchful eye of parents. My kids go to school on the next street, and when I saw the school, I panicked, and I ran and I ran for my children. I spent all afternoon here watching them rescue people. Crews brought in wooden beams to shore up the school building, and ultimately they spotted one survivor, but pulled 25 bodies from the rubble, all but four of them children. The same scenes were repeated over and over across the region. Hundreds of people hunting for the living and dead, and survivors telling of narrow escapes. It was a very hard hit that went down. I went to find my child and I couldn't. I was trapped on the third floor, and the people in the house next door helped me get out with a ladder. I am just grateful to God that we are here for something. In Morello State, where 60 percent of the residents lost power, they began burying their dead and surveying the damage today. The good thing is that my wife and my grandson were the only ones there. She's injured a little, but she's there alive. The quake hit less than two weeks after an even stronger tremor struck southern Mexico and killed nearly 100 people. It also came on the 32nd anniversary of the 1985 earthquake in Mexico City that killed thousands. There had even been earthquake drills yesterday morning. In a national address last night, Mexico's President Peña Nieto spoke of his country's resilience in the face of repeated disasters. This earthquake is a hard test and a painful one for our country. Mexicans have had very difficult experiences with earthquakes in the past, and we have learned how to respond to these incidents with a spirit of solidarity. From New York today, President Trump spoke to Peña Nieto at length. And at the Vatican, Pope Francis led thousands of people in prayer for the earthquake victims. For more, joining us from Mexico City is Gus Valcarcel with the Associated Press. Gus, tell us where you are and what you've been seeing today. Hi, Judy. I am in the Roma Norte district of Mexico City a residential commercial area. And right behind me, as you can probably see, is an apartment building that came crumbling down. This obviously happened yesterday in the afternoon. And at least 20 bodies have been pulled out of the rubble, Judy. A very sad moment for Mexico and for this community. The good news is they, uh, they are apparently uh, hearing some uh, noises that the experts believe are people who may still be alive inside those rubbles. So the, they are not losing hope that they will find more survivors. Gus Valcarcel reporting for us from Mexico City. Thank you. Mexico is not the only country to have been hit by a powerful earthquake in recent days. Places dotted around the so-called Pacific Ring of Fire have been rocked by a series of strong quakes in recent days. Fortunately, none as deadly as the one in Mexico. For more about the sharp uptick in seismic activity around the ring, here's our Pak Tsuan. 
In recent days, a series of powerful earthquakes have hit countries situated along the so-called Ring of Fire regions surrounding the Pacific Ocean that are prone to quakes and volcanic eruptions. In Taiwan, a magnitude 5.7 earthquake struck the east of the island nation late Wednesday. Although no casualties or damages have reported, the country's Central Weather Bureau said aftershocks of intensity 4 and 5 magnitude were detected. In Japan, a 6.1 magnitude earthquake struck off the east coast of the country. According to the U.S. Geological Survey's website, the quake hit before the crack of dawn on Thursday, some 320 kilometers east of Fukushima, where a massive earthquake and tsunami led to the Fukushima nuclear disaster in 2011. New Zealand, another country in the Ring of Fire, was hit by a 6.1 magnitude undersea quake on Wednesday afternoon, rattling the southwest of the country. A magnitude 6.4 quake struck Vanuatu's fourth largest island, Aromango, in the Pacific Ocean on Thursday. It struck the center of the island at around 7 in the morning. The so-called Ring of Fire stretches over some 40,000 kilometers along the boundary of the Pacific Plate and the smaller plates that line the edge of the Pacific Ocean. Earthquakes happen as the plates grind up against each other and produce friction. It's not a matter of if, but when. As Mexico reels from its 7.1 magnitude earthquake, California, from Los Angeles to San Francisco, is anxious and on edge about what so many fear will be the big one. Did you feel that? A small earthquake shook L.A. earlier this week, but a study from the U.S. Geological Survey says the chance of a quake magnitude 8 or larger in the next 30 years has doubled since 2008. Experts say a major quake along the San Andreas Fault in Southern California could kill 1,800 people, injure 53,000, destroy 1,500 buildings, and damage 300,000 more. A serious quake could also cripple the city's water supply and take as long as six months to repair. Who thinks about the pipes in the ground? We don't want to spend money on that. It's, it's out of sight, out of mind. While nearly $14 billion has been spent on seismic upgrades to transportation infrastructure, including bridges, the city of Los Angeles now requires property owners to retrofit buildings that cannot withstand a strong earthquake. Do you feel like L.A. is ready? L.A. is getting ready and is probably far more ready than a lot of other cities. But there's L.A.'s huge, there's a lot of old structures. A new preparedness plan has landed on Mayor Eric Garcetti's desk and has not yet been released. And the U.S. House recently approved federal funding for an earthquake early warning system as California prepares now for a worst-case scenario that may come with no warning at all. A massive fault line in California has scientists sounding the horn over an expected major earthquake. Instead of the usual warnings over a quake in the distant future, usually decades, this one is expected any day now. RT's Lindsay France spoke with me earlier from Los Angeles. I asked her, what are the indicators that make this earthquake so urgent? Well, this earthquake hit uh, across the Hayward Fault. The Hayward Fault runs under the Bay Area, through Oakland, through Berkeley. It runs under a lot of heavily populated areas. This hit about 3 a.m., uh, and it was it registered a 4.0 on the Richter scale. It was about five miles below the surface of the Earth. So. What scientists are saying is that this fault line uh, historically has been shown to shift massively and produce a huge earthquake about one every 140 years. And right now, we're at 147 years since its last major shift. Now, during after this uh, 4.0 earthquake, uh, it was reported that uh, Magnitude 1.0 to 2.7 earthquakes, at least a dozen, were reported in that area. So those were aftershocks, and there's a worry that uh, the initial earthquake and along with the aftershocks could put us on the brink of uh, a big one along that fault line. Of course, everyone here is scared of it. I'm scared of it right now, sitting 12 floors above Los Angeles. So uh, it's, you know, it's always scary, but it's really odd that scientists are saying this because it's just such a tight timeline, geologically speaking. 
Right. Well, technology used for earthquake prediction has clearly improved a lot recently for seismologists. So what are they using to see into the future of fault line activity? You're right, it's really progressed quite a bit. What they can do now is they can create these complex models of what these fault lines look like. They use geospatial mapping, uh, satellites, and even aerial, uh, aerial photographs to take a look at the shifts. And what they found, alarmingly, is that you can take an earthquake in one area and draw a line to another area and say it's very likely that something here will happen over there because they're showing that the fault lines are in fact interconnected and we've got some big ones out here that are connected through little ones. And that is something that scientists have had to accept and it opens up an entirely new can of worms on predicting what the damage could be. If you take a look at the 1906 San Francisco earthquake that ravaged the city, mm -hmm. that city has a hundred times the population that it used to. Scary, and we were watching some of that video as you were talking of, you know, just scary images of these earthquakes, but let's not forget about the business of fear-mongering. It can generate quite a lot of sales for businesses who benefit from this in California. You tell someone an earthquake could happen any second, they're going to stock up. So who's benefiting? Absolutely. It's a it's a multi-million dollar business uh, out here. And in some ways you might not expect if you're not living in an earthquake zone. So we're talking your typical stuff, water, water purifiers, flashlights, things like that. But also what we're talking about is earthquake insurance. If you look up in the Hollywood Hills, and in fact, just behind me, if you ever have a chance to drive through there, you will see mansions literally built on stilts that are driven into the ground seemingly through dirt. So there's going to be, if there's a massive shakeout here, it's going to cause infrastructure damage like we may have never seen before, mm -hmm. and uh, in addition to possible tsunamis. So stocking up on supplies, but also those insurance rates go through the roof in preparation for these things, especially when news like this hits. So someone out there is making a pretty penny. Off this story, and your story nonetheless, Lindsay. That was RT correspondent Lindsay France from our Los Angeles studio. Thank you. Well, right now, a warning for Southern California about the increased risk of a major earthquake. Experts say a series of small quakes along the San Andreas Fault could lead to a bigger one, and people in the area should revisit their emergency plans. This, of course, is the area of concern, as you're seeing on your screen, and it's no stranger to disaster. In 1994, the Northridge Ridge earthquake killed 57 people, injured thousands more, causing billions of dollars in property damage. Most recently, along the San Andreas Fault system, the same one we're talking about was that earthquake in South Napa and that happened in 2014 was a magnitude of 6.0 certainly caused a lot of damage as well. Uh, joining us Richard Allen the director of seismological lab at UC Berkeley. Richard it's great to have you back on the program. Great to be with you. you know, it's interesting to look at earthquake forecasting as we're watching a major storm on the east coast of the United States. We're all familiar with weather forecasting somewhat. Is forecasting an earthquake similar? It's very similar in the sense that we sort of know that on any given day there's a chance of an earthquake and we can associate a probability with that. But then when we have a swarm like this, it increases the likelihood. It's the same thing as when there's a hurricane out in the ocean and we're trying to predict and estimate the likelihood that it will hit a particular coastal city. Same idea, we're trying to look into the future and come up with a likelihood. So tell us a little bit about the swarm that happened about seven days ago. What about that swarm was notable? So this was a small, a small swarm, well, I say small, a few hundred earthquakes. The largest earthquake was only about a magnitude 4.3, but it was down in the Salton Sea, very close to the southern end of the San Andreas Fault. And when we see events like this, it makes seismologists get a little concerned because it's a lot of activity close to a big fault, and we know that that increases the likelihood of a bigger earthquake on the big fault. And so that what's, that's what gets us all a little alarmed. So walk us through these numbers. The likelihood of an earthquake on any given day is what? So on a given day or within a seven day period, this advisory was for seven days. So in a seven day period, the likelihood of a big earthquake on the southern San Andreas is about one in 6,000. And so this forecast suggested a heightened alert about that, a heightened probability. What was that? 
So somewhere in the range of one in 3,000 to one in 100. So up to a 1% likelihood of a larger magnitude earthquake on the southern San Andreas. So that's suddenly a number that means something to all of us, I think. So what does that mean to you? Because those numbers, you know, when you hear one in 100 for, for me, you know, I'm thinking, okay, that sounds like that's, that's a high probability. But for someone like you who studies earthquakes on a regular basis, how do you see these numbers? Well, this is a big increase. I can tell you it makes the hair stick up on the back of my neck, and I start to think about what might actually happen if that big earthquake occurs today or in the course of this one-week period. So the one-week period actually ends today. We've had this warning for the last seven days, and so far, Richard, no earthquake. Does that mean we're in the clear? Well, of course, we're never in the clear, unfortunately. The earthquake can happen at any time on any day. But it does mean that we're sort of in the end of this sort of heightened um, period of concern. The likelihood of that big event happening actually decays over a period of days. And so the advisory for, for a seven-day window, which is now over, but so that means we're past this little hump. But nobody should think that means we're in the clear. We are never in the clear. We always have to be ready for that earthquake. You know, we're showing images from 1989 in San Francisco. That's my hometown. And certainly you, you see the devastation from a really large earthquake. As we finish up here, we're seeing some images as well from Napa in 2014. And it's easy to forget the damage that earthquakes can cause. I just wanted to ask you, Richard, before we let you go, one of the things I've seen written in a few different articles on this topic is that we're due, meaning that the San Andreas Fault is, is ready for another major event. Why is that? Yeah, there's no question the San Andreas is ready for another big earthquake. The last major damaging earthquake in Southern California was in 1857. We think that the recurrence interval um, is, is much shorter than the time that's passed since then. Up in San Francisco, the Hayward Fault has a recurrence interval of about 140 years, and the last earthquake was in 1868. So in both cases, you know, we could argue that we're due for another earthquake. So again, this is just a good reason for us all to revisit our emergency plans, make sure we have our emergency kits, and think about how good the buildings that we live and work in are and whether they will su survive the earthquake. We know whatever coast you're on in our country today, whether it's the East Coast looking at the hurricane or the West Coast thinking about earthquakes, it great reminder about those emergency kits. Richard, it's always a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks for being with you.